So, um, today we'll talk about the um, last um, category of models that, unfortunately, we only have one lecture to do this, but these are uh, long-term models. So what we have seen so far in the course was a lot of detail about daily operations. We spent a couple of uh, lectures talking about medium-term planning, like monthly to annual decision-making. And the category of models that I'm going to talk about today is the long run, you know, how we plan energy systems over decades. Um, so these are called capacity expansion planning models. Um, I'm going to go through some of the slides fast because uh, there's plenty of models that I wanted to, to cover, so maybe the examples, I won't go into them in too much uh, detail, but the idea is to, like we've done so far in the course, the first question we answer is, if there was a um, nice God out there that knew everything, how would he plan uh, the system? in the future, but then the real world is not composed of people who work for the benefit of mankind, the circuit's composed of people who do the best for themselves, so we're going to address the question of uh, decentralized planning, how this works in the market environment. And the last uh, thing I'm going to touch on is if the world is not ideal, I would assume over here, what's going to uh, what's going to happen, what are the problems, and what are the solutions for, for policy makers. Okay, but before going there, let's talk a bit about the planning problem in general. So what we're going to be thinking of is the decision of... So, so far what we've been thinking about is operation of the system. So given the generators we have in the system, how do we produce from each of them? Uh, the question now becomes not only how do we produce from each of the generators in the system, but actually which generator should we construct in the system uh, over multiple, um, over a deep time horizon. So we're going to think of this as a two-stage uh, optimization problem, and those of you that have taken operations research will have seen this model uh, before. The first stage of decision is which technologies should I invest in? And there's a capital cost associated with that. And then the second stage decisions are after I have invested in this mix of technologies, which of them uh, will I use to serve uh, loads? And so this is a, nat you can naturally express this model in its simple version. As a two-stage model. First, I invest iron on the ground, and then once the iron is on the ground, I, I run my uh, my generators. Okay, and um, the answer to the question, um, what generators to invest in, and how much each of them should produce during the year, really depends on what load you have in the network. That has to come into the equation somehow. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, load and not uh, demand uh, because we're going to see models with both flexible demand but also inflexible demand. What I refer to as uh, load is basically the demand you would have had in a, in a system if the price uh, were zero. So. Um, the maximum, um, well, usually we, we see here uh, valuations and here quantities, and we think of these as block bids in a market. But if you rotate the axis, the axis here, so, um, you get. something that maps price economy. Everything okay? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> okay. And so um, what I've done here, I flipped the, the axis around, so I'm mapping quantity here and price here, 
And what I'm referring to as load is the peak over here. Or the other way to think about it is if power were for free, how many people would want to consume it? So it's this point over here, or if once I click the axis, it's this point over here. Whereas demand for a given price is if, if I had uh, this price over here, only this many people, but this would be the demand that I would have given the price. So demand is associated with the price, whereas load is the demand I would have had if the price uh, was zero. So for example, in a single system with a generator that can produce 100 megawatts and a demand function like this, so V is price, and this is the, uh, this line over uh, here, the load is how much? If V were free, cheap, for, um, zero, you would get 110 megawatts of a uh, consumer wanting to consume power, but demand can never be above 100 megawatts because the price at 100 megawatts will, will uh, jump in this system to a level where, uh, since you only have a supply that's 100 megawatts, you cannot have a demand that will be more than that because uh, there's no price that can support that. Okay, so basically load is the maximum possible demand you could get. Okay, so um, let's think of a system without demand response right now. Let's think of, um, we're, we're planning an, an energy system down the line, and we're making here the worst case assumption that uh, there will be uh, no uh, price responsive demand. So we make a forecast for uh, for example, for the Belgian network for 40 years down the line. And we uh, are expecting this much load growth. And so one way to very concisely describe uh, load over a year is a load duration curve. And what you do is you have, um, the, let, let's look at the year, for example, 2014. Uh, let's, uh, the way to build the load duration curve is you take the time series of um, load from hour 1 to hour 8760, that's one full year. And you put in an Excel file and the load in hour 1, the load in hour 2, it's going to be something like this. Yeah. And then you're going to take that uh, data structure and sort it in decreasing order. Okay, so you pick the highest hour, the hour of highest load first, and you create a new data structure that puts this guy first. You pick the uh, hour of second highest load second, you put it over here, and you sort these this data in decreasing order, and you basically get a, a decreasing curve, which is the load duration curve. Think of what this, what information is in this uh, curve. Suppose I ask you, um, what is the value of your load duration curve for uh, for this uh, uh, tau over here? You look at your curve, you give me a number. It's the amount of hours that where the, 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 the electricity is higher than, uh, than two. So the answer I will give you is exactly, um, it's not the amount of hours. I ask you tau, you answer D of tau, what is D of tau? The price at which... Uh, Forget prices. We're, we're thinking of a completely inelastic, uh, you know, customer come in, this is how much they ask, the demand. Right. So, 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 the of tau then is the demand which you have uh, two hours for the demand. For those many hours, 
D below was D of T or higher. That's D of T, exactly. Um, then if I ask you, here's D, what's the inverse? Uh, um, what's the inverse mapping? So what would you get here? If I give you D and you did the inverse mapping, then you get the amount of words which is uh, higher or equal to Exactly. Exactly. So what I've done with this data structure is basically I've taken a really funny looking time series and I've collapsed it to this very um, concise information. Now, this is basically all the information you need to solve a capacity planning uh, problem, in fact, uh, with inflexible demand, okay? If, uh, if I know that this is how my load will be coming in and I need to serve all of my load, this uh, um, doesn't matter how load fluctuates from day to day, if it increases in the morning, it increases in the evening, what I only care about is the hours for which the load was this much or higher, because that will determine which uh, generators will serve that slice. And we'll see that now. Um, okay. This is a way in which I can write the capacity expansion planning problem as, an, as a two-stage optimization problem. So what I've done here is um, I have two decision variables, X and P. X is the amount of investment in technology G. So um, there's a set of candidate technologies that I can invest in. Each of them has an investment cost, capital I. Um, so each megawatt I construct of that technology, I pay, uh, so it's expressed in dollars per megawatt, basically. And also each technology has a fuel cost, capital C. Um, if I had a set of technologies, of character technology, and I indexed them like this, what can you tell me about their fuel costs? If they're going to be interesting for this optimization problem. I is the dollar per unit of capacity that I pay for, for building the technology. And C is the dollar per unit of output, of production. What can you, so, so I give you five technologies. Um, I sort them in uh, increasing order of investment cost. What can you tell me about the capital C? If all of these technologies are worth looking at. What, the single three? Suppose um, this is true. What can you immediately tell me about one of these technologies? Come again. Right. So, so uh, I can take my technology, sort their investment costs. The fuel costs have to be ordered in the inverse. Uh, have have to be. Um, if the investment costs are increasing, the fuel costs have to be decreasing. Otherwise, one of, at least one of these guys is pointless to look at. Okay? Uh, it's dominated by, by another technology. Okay, so what is this uh, optimization problem uh, telling me? Um, I have an index uh, J. These indices correspond to these... Um, uh, modes over here. So, for example, J, uh, J equals 1. Okay, this bunch of demand over here is base load. So, it's those customers who have, uh, whose uh, demand level is this much 
or higher, and this happens for all the year. So, uh, for example, in Belgium, we know that electricity demand never ever falls below five gigawatts. Uh, even in the day of lowest consumption, that's one of the issues. Then there's a slice of customers that want a bit more, but they are asking for it for fewer hours in the year. That's mode number two. And there's a slice of customers who are asking for a hell of a lot of power, but it's only for a few hours per year. And that's the highest mode, little end. So um, I create this index J. So high J corresponds to high power requests, but for a short duration of time. And what I do is I define delta 1 as this duration here, so tau 1 minus tau 2. I define delta 2 as tau 2 minus tau 3. Ta -ta -ta -ta. I define delta m as tau m minus 0. So um, the deltas that you see in this model here are basically the widths of these columns over here, okay? So I can write my uh, investment planning problem in this form over here. I have two sources of cost, investment cost, and then I have fuel cost. The um, fuel cost I pay is proportional to how much uh, power I give to, to a certain uh, J, but also for how long I give it, okay? And I need to satisfy, because my demand is inflexible, I need to satisfy all of, uh, all of the demand that appears, and my production cannot exceed the capacity that I've uh, invested, basically. The problem is clear? Okay. This is what I uh, mentioned earlier. In fact, the indexing in the slide is opposite. Uh, yeah. So, what you can do with this model, and uh, I, yeah, what you can do with this model is add a lot of detail. What I've shown you is a very simple vanilla version of the model, but you can add transmission constraints, capacity factors, you can have uh, flexible demand. You can be solving this not only over two stages, but multiple stages. You can have um, discount rates for capital, you can have a stochastic programming version which we've seen in oper the operations research uh, class as well. So here's a way where you can solve the problem actually um, just graphically without even write, having to write a, a linear program. Um, what I'm drawing here is basically um, okay Let's think of what the trade-offs are um, in this problem. And let's think of for this block over here. Which of these guys would be more appropriate? One, two, or three. Um, for this block over here, for base load. The biggest investment will imply the smallest fuel. So indeed, when something lasts for the whole year, you're willing to pay a big investment, uh, but at least you have a low fuel cost, so since this guy will be producing for the entire year, it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth a big investment to get away with a small fuel cost. On the contrary, um, for, for this block over here, it'll be very short duration. So there, even if the fuel cost is really high, what you want to get away with is something that's cheap to invest in because this guy, you will have him sitting around for a whole year and they might run only for 10 hours in the year. So you don't care if they're burning hero as long as they're investing the cost. 
is low. That's really the trade-off of the capacity expansion planning uh, problem. And indeed, that's how real systems are run. Um, what do you think is the technology that serves this block over here? Yeah. Moving your base load, and over here we have really fast um, combined cycle units, or um, oil units, in fact. Um, so here's a graphical solution to the problem. What am I doing here? I'm plotting the cost of, of running uh, technology one and technology two as a function of how many hours I ran that technology. For loads that last less than tau bar, which one of the two technologies should I choose? For loads that last, yeah, less than tau bar. Right. And those that are shorter lifetime, I go with technology one. Immediately, you come up with a graphical solution. You don't even need to uh, solve an LP, but the LP will help us with the analysis later. So for this block here, I'm going to choose the lowest. Um, uh, and the breakpoint, by the way, is uh, tau bar. So any demand, to any load block that lasts less than tau bar, will be, that slice will be served by um, the, 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 you know, the technology f which for that tau is the lowest tau. So this is a graphical solution to the problem. Now, uh, that said, um, I want to briefly talk about the units we use here because um, it's a little bit uh, confusing what we actually need to put as data into this uh, curve over here. So often in investment planning problems, what people give you as data is um, overnight cost, uh, which is usually expressed in dollars per kilowatt. And that's basically saying, this is the amount of money that you would need to pay today to get this thing uh, built. But when we're looking over deep time horizons, we start thinking of, um, uh, time value of money and interest rates. So um, we basically want to translate this overnight uh, cost to uh, something that I would need to be paying uh, continuously. Have you done this calculation in any class? Or is this something that we hear for the uh, first time? How you convert flows of money over time to present value and so on? Okay, for the, you know, for, let's think in, ter in terms of, hmm? R right, financial engineering, kind of, kind of introductory financial engineering. The way I want to think of, I don't want to get into details of interest rates and all that, I just want you to think uh, in terms of investment as a continuous flow of uh, cash. What we're going to try and, try, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do with this slide is uh, translate an amount of money that you pay today to something that you will need to be paying for uh, 40 years. So, um, because the, the reason I want to do that is so that you can use a uh, screening curve. Because screening curves correspond to something that your energy, um, the fuel cost here corresponds to something that you're paying continuously as long as you're producing that much. I want you to translate a fixed investment cost payment to something that you're paying continuously over every hour or over every uh, uh, year. So the way you do that is through the um, uh, discounting formula here if you have annual discounting or uh, through, through this formula over here if you have continuous discounting but um, these are pretty close for uh, long horizons. So once you're given data as overnight cost in dollars per kilowatt, you can convert it to dollars per kilowatt year, so a flow of cash that you need to be paying every year for this investment through this uh, formula over here. So you get uh, the annualized fixed investment cost. Now, 
once you have some a flow that you need to pay over 40 years, uh, but it's expressed in dollars per kilowatt every year, so the amount of money you need to pay for one kilowatt capacity over an entire year, you can easily come from there to the amount of money you need to pay for a megawatt of capacity every hour. It's just, uh, this is a thousand times like a kilowatt, and there's 8,760 hours per year. So you can easily translate a flow over a full year for a single kilowatt to a flow over every hour for a whole megawatt. And all you do is divide the FC by 8.76. That's what I'm uh, describing here. And now, once you describe an investment in these terms, you can compare it as apple to apple with the fuel cost, which is also expressed in dollars per, per megawatt hour. And so, then um, what, what, once you've transformed, so, you know, suppose I give you data for a, uh, for a uh, investment planning problem in dollars per kilowatt, you can do these uh, transformations, uh, write it uh, as dollars per megawatt hour, and then you plot the screening curve that I showed you earlier as um, a function of uh, capacity factor. So the fraction of the year that a unit is running. So then in this curve over here, the way you solve the problem graphically is you look at capacity factor, fraction of time over a year that a unit is running, and the I1 is expressed in dollars per megawatt hour through this conversion over here, and the fuel cost usually is anyways given in dollars per megawatt hour. So that's how you do the transformation of the units. Okay, and here's an example of uh, doing that. So uh, if we have two technologies, gas and coal, the gas investment will last 25 years. So the 25 years here is the capital T parameter in this slide over here, expressed in years in this formula. The interest rate is 12%, so 0.12. You plug in this number into the formula I showed you earlier, you get dollars per kilowatt year for the gas turbine is 50.5, and then you divide it by 8.76, you get the dollars per megawatt hour, the same for the coal. <coughs> okay, now. Um, Okay, um, that's how you solve a uh, capacity planning problem where the incoming demand is insensitive to price, so you need to really meet this, uh, uh, this load. But now let's think of how you would uh, plan a system if in fact you had uh, flexible demand, so uh, consumers were uh, flexible to price. And here, the way to think of uh, the problem is that now each J in this problem doesn't correspond anymore to a fixed block that is inflexible. Each J describes a demand function. So each J corresponds to a, a function like this, and we know how to model these functions in, um, in uh, planning and operations problems, we just have blocks, right? We have a demand block here, which is uh, D1J, uh, so uh, uh, the first index is indexing which block we are in, this is uh, D2, D3, and the duration is uh, here delta 1, the duration of this block is delta 2, the duration of this block is, uh, sorry, the, the, the price, um, okay, the other way around. <laughs> this is uh, the demand level of the block, this is the price, and so on. Uh, this is the demand level, this is the price, and this is the demand level, and this is the price for demand function. Um, this is, you know, the usual way we uh, represent demand functions so far in economic dispatch and so on. It's the same exact uh, model, so there's nothing new here. So the VLJ corresponds to the valuations, the VLJ corresponds to the width of that uh, block. 
Okay, this is uh, this should be look familiar. Okay, so now what has changed in the problem is just that we're representing flexible demand. So we have a d, little d decision variable, which means we can choose to serve less than the full width. This is the constraint that says we can serve up to the full width of demand. And the benefit we get from serving that uh, uh, specific segment is, depends on the price bid of that uh, demand. Okay, um, I have a bunch of KKT conditions and you know a characterization of the optimal solution. So you know we can we can take the um, uh, the KKT conditions of this problem and start asking questions like when uh, should a unit produce as a function of the KKT conditions and all that. Um, it's probably ambitious to try and cover that right now. So I will skip these slides, but this is the usual analysis of the KVP conditions that we've been doing so far for all of this problem. Um, so, well, let's, let's see an example of at least of the consumption uh, criterion. So what, ke what do I know from the KKT conditions? If there is a slice L in my problem where demand is positive, but it's less than the block. The width of that block. I can go here and notice that if this constraint is loose, then uh, nu has to be zero, right? At the same time, if the demand is positive for that slice, then this constraint has to be active, but the nu here is zero. So that is immediately telling me that delta times valuation of the slice equals the row j. So basically, if someone walked up to me and told me, you know what, I don't have the optimal solution for this problem, but somehow, magically, I have the optimal for multipliers, what could you tell that guy if he told you uh, that, for example, the row j is strictly bigger than um, this thing here, well, you could tell him in the, if that were true, then that load could never be above zero and below capital D. Something else must be going on with that load. And in fact, what would be going on would be uh, this situation over here. So basically, the row, if someone walked up to you and told you the row, you could define thresholds. Blocks with evaluation equal to row divided by delta are strictly above zero but below capital D. If I know that the valuation is below this threshold, then I know that that block does not want the power enough, so its demand is zero. And if the valuations are above this threshold, then I know that load is really eager, so his demand is at the maximum possible level. So this row basically defines a threshold for whether consumers are consuming or not. Um, not surprisingly, we will see that this corresponds to prices in the market model. Same analysis for generators. And then there's an investment criterion that says if x is zero over here, then this constraint does not have to be active. In fact, if the guy who came and told me the rows also knew the, the new over here, he told he, this guy walked up and told me, here are the optimal dual multiplier for this problem, uh, new. DJ, and I found that investment cost was bigger than the sum here for some technology, I could immediately tell him, well, I know that technology will not be invested if investment cost is too big, bigger than the sum here, I know that technology is too expensive to run, so I will never invest it. But the question is how you come up with the news. We don't really care about that, but there's an economic interpretation to these dual multipliers that we will see. Uh, they will come up again in the market model. And here's an example of all of this with these two technologies that we found their investment costs earlier. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but you can verify that these conditions go through in a two technology example with three demand modes. Okay. Any questions? Looking good. Ah, now about this specific problem here. 
And there's also a graphical way to solve it using the spring curve that we showed earlier. You will notice in these three types of demands that I'm giving you that all of them have a vibration of 1000. So all of the uh, flexible demand bids are, I'm willing to pay 1000 to consume up to this much. Well, a way to think of this demand bid is if I cut a single megawatt from this guy that is asking me for, one, uh, for this much demand, that will hurt him by $1,000 per megawatt hour. So an equivalent way of thinking of these flexible demand bids is uh, think of this problem as a problem without demand this one, with inflexible demand, and think that you have a, an extra technology with zero investment cost and a fuel cost of equal to the valuation of this guy, which is $1,000 per megawatt hour. Well, the way that would show up in a screening curve is like a really steep uh, technology, right? Costs zero to invest, but $1,000 per megawatt hour to curtail that guy. And immediately, you would know that any nodes with a duration to the left of this intersection here should be curtailed. Any nodes with a duration between here and here should be served by the gas technology. Any guys who are sticking around for the whole, for this much longer, up to the whole year, should be served by the cheapest capital uh, technology, which is coal. Okay, so we could have also eyeballed the solution to this um, problem by using screen curve. And that's, you know, we're just discussing that over here. Okay, uh, and like I said earlier, uh, you can take this model that I showed you, the capacity expansion planning model, and extend it to multiple time stages, throw into it uh, uncertainty. That's actually something I've covered in the operations research class, and it's, it's a really popular problem. You can make it really, really rich and still keep it as a linear program. It's an interesting problem. Okay. Um, we have a bit of time. Uh, okay, let's think now of uh, in all of this discussion, even with flexible demand, I never departed from the assumption that there is this uh, benevolent, good central planner out there who's deciding everything. Let's now look at how a market uh, would, would work like. And we're going to again come into a fully good model. So um, when we're thinking of a market equilibrium, um, we immediately want to start thinking, OK, this is now a market environment of investment. Who are the players in the market? And what are they trying um, to achieve? Well, what the, player, the players are usually producers, consumers, and system operators. What they're trying to achieve depends on the rules of the game. And there are many different rules for capacity uh, planning. Uh, and we'll see why, you know, people do it very differently. They do it very differently in Europe, um, in the UK, in New Zealand, in the United States. There are very different rules about giving people incentives to invest in capacity. This is a really, really interesting uh, discussion. Um, one of the key policy issues for, uh, for European system. Okay, before going into details, let me quickly define um, a couple of things. One way to do things are energy-only markets. What are energy-only markets? Uh, you want to invest in generation, good luck. The only source of revenue for you will be selling energy in the energy market. You will not get rewarded in any other way for putting iron on the ground. 
there are different markets, like for example, capacity markets where people will just pay you to build. And on, on top of that, you also get cash for selling in the energy market. And the reason people do that is to give security to the investors that you know, if I put iron on the ground, at least some of that money will come back to me the moment the iron is on the ground. And in energy energy markets, that's not the case. If you want to invest, take your chances, and hopefully, over these 40 years, electricity prices will be high enough that you get back your money plus some. Okay. Um, now, the plus sum, the extra money you get on top of your fuel costs, I'm referring to as scarcity rents. So scarcity rents are what will pay for your investment in an energy uh, market. So it's the extra profit you make above your uh, fuel cost. Here is how uh, we can put scarcity rent graphically. So in a single hour when we're doing economic dispatch, if this is my supply curve over here, this is actually not a very good figure um, because this box should not be right. So the supply curve is this thing here, okay? Um, if the demand curve is this, what would it look like? If this is my supply curve and I have a demand curve like this, we will just set to get the price. So for technologies up to this level, there is a profit, which we refer to as a scarcity rent. It's a market price minus their fuel cost. Well, technologies that made this bit over here, they're not earning any scarcity rent for this hour because the market price, which is B, is exactly what the fuel cost. Which do you think is the, the riskiest technology to invest in? Out of the industry. Why do you think so? But, on the upside, this guy will have the lowest bid. And so, yeah, he's going to earn more cash than the others. But, he knows he will be running for longer. Think of this one here. There are units out there, and this is not just like I've done my discussion, this is happening in GBS web. They invested in gas with the hope of running this. You know, gas will only kick in when everything else is, uh, when the demand is so high that the fuel cost of gas is justified. That's just a few hours every year. You invest in something very expensive and you have it sitting around for the whole year, except for those few hours where electricity prices go out of the roof, and you hope to bring all the money in for, from those few hours for your investment. So pickers, uh, pick units with high investment, uh, low investment costs with high fuel costs, it's very uncertain for how many hours it will run in a year. Um, so that is a source of risk in uh, energy only market because exactly because these guys will be lying somewhere over here or maybe even further. So it's very the case that the demand function will go that high to bring them to the money. That's the, that's the problem with pickers. Okay, uh, but in theory, at least, um, they will make uh, their, their expenses. So we will put that, that to an equilibrium model. If, what, what the theory says is that if it's worth investing in them in a centralized model where there's this good God that is doing the best for everybody, then it's worth also investing in them in the market. That's what the theory says and that's what we're going to prove right now. Okay, so how do we describe an equilibrium model for uh, an energy only market? Well, we think of who are the actors, what are they selling, what are the markets where they're getting money from. The actors are uh, producers and consumers in this model. What is scarce is uh, how much energy you can offer and what capacity is available. But what we really need to describe our equilibrium model, I'm realizing that I'm standing exactly in front of 
maybe like this. Um, the, have you been able to see anything all this time? No, no, no. You have not been able to see? See, 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 to a boy. To a boy, okay. So, the only market we have in an energy, only, uh, the only source of revenue we have in an energy only market is um, revenue from energy. There is no cash coming in for capacity investment. There, there are different markets that pay for capacity. Okay, so here's the equilibrium model for um, an energy only market. I have the producer's problem. Again, when we're writing equilibrium models, we think, uh, quantity adjustment, price adjustment. Quantity adjustment takes place for the actors, the agents. So they see a price, they change quantity to optimize profits. Price adjustment takes place for markets. So markets adjust the prices to squeeze profits, uh, to, to, uh, um, to equilibrate supply and demand. So quantity adjustment for the producer is I take in a price for uh, energy, uh, for, for demand uh, type J. So the J here indexes high demand or low demand and the energy price will of course be different if the demand is high or low. That's what the J is indexing. So what am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to maximize my uh, my profit. Well, my profit is my revenue, so the energy price. So row now indicates energy price, minus my fuel cost, times how many hours of that year was demand high or low, times how much did I offer to the market for those hours of the year. And there's another uh, element here of investment cost. And I can only produce up to the level that I invest. This is very important for the class for the exam, for everything, being able to really quickly get the KPT conditions for any maximization problem. So this is, we've done this like a million times, so hopefully it's easy. Is it easy? Or? Okay. Um, so this is what we get. Uh, and so this, this is what we get. This is the quantity adjustment problem of the producer. This is the quantity adjustment problem of the consumer. What is the consumer trying to do? It's the usual. Um, the benefit maximization problem. This is my valuation for energy. This is the price for energy. This is how much I will consume. What I consume is less than or equal to my quantity bid. These are the KKT conditions. And now we also have an energy market. The energy market, and note these guys are now taking the energy price as, as a given. The price adjustment of the energy market will be such that the following condition holds. Um, if the price is positive, then it will be such that it will adjust supply to exactly equal demand. If there is an oversupply, then the price for that, uh, then the price for energy will be zero. Standard market clearance. This, you know, the logic of these problem direct conditions is also something I really want to, to to remember. When we have a market, market clearing condition for that market says price will adjust for that market to equilibrate supply and demand for that commodity. And if I have an oversupply, the price will be zero. This is like Newton's law of uh, motion for for uh, competitive markets. Okay. Um, okay. Now, what do you guess will happen if I take the complementarity condition here and the KKT conditions here and the KKT conditions here? They will be the same as the KKT conditions of what? Of which problem? The centralized problem over here. Exactly slide 14, which is the KKT conditions of this. Well, I mean, you have to do some rescaling of the row. The row has different, slightly different row. It's the same row, but with a you know, scale factor. It, it shows up a bit differently in the other KKT conditions, but bottom line is 
market will produce the efficient outcome. Okay. Um, now, a bit more discussion about this model. And then we'll take a break. Um, okay, first result to remember, markets are efficient, the KKD conditions are identical. Ah, and I'm not gonna go into this, um, but if you threw in transmission constraints and you had an LMP market, then the same would have happened. So the fact that you had a transmission constraint network with LMP markets re will still result in an optimal investment. If you threw in demand side uncertainty, again, the same result would have uh, come about. One thing I want to pay attention to now is the role of the new multiplier in this model. If production is positive for some generator, this, uh, this will hold as an equality. So the new will be price minus fuel cost for that duration. We kind of defined this already. This slide I can go. In that drawing I showed you, this is the scarcity rate. This is this area over here. Okay, it's the profit you make for your investment for those hours when price is above your fuel cost. And what is this condition here saying? Something very intuitive. What ha um, when will X be zero for sure? Tell me one condition that will guarantee that X is zero. The hint is you can get it from here. Strictly bigger. Strictly bigger. Um, then the sum of the scarcity. It's very intuitive, right? Um, if my investment cost is bigger than what I would have earned from the markup above my fuel cost from uh, the energy markets, I'm not going to get my money back. So I'm not going to invest. So now, you know, this complementarity condition has economic uh, content. It's very intuitive what it's telling. On the other hand, by the way, um, in a competitive market, I will never make profit above investment. Uh, why? Because competition will bring other guys in. If they see that I'm making profit, they will also invest and so on. So the scarcity rents are never going to be above investment cost. They're always going to be less than investment cost. But uh, you know, if, I, if I have actually invested in that technology, for sure I will recover my investment cost from the profit. But in a competitive market, I'm not going to make more than that. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say from slide 31. Ah, and I'm solving again this two technology system. I don't want to torture you with the numerical details, but well, let's look at the solution really quick. So the optimal solution, I didn't tell you that earlier, but the optimal thing to do in the system is invest 4,000 megawatts in coal, and 3,975 megawatts in gas. And if you run this um, complementary system in k neutral, you will get these energy prices here. Um, what do you think happened here? How did we get that price? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was actually, right, so that 1,000, but it wasn't really fuel cost, what was it? It was something, I represented it as a fuel cost. 
well, not a technology. The only two technologies we have are these two over here, and the fuel cost is no more than $30. And whatever. So somebody else is setting that price. These are the demand functions. In an economic basis, if it becomes uh, very much uh, energy, it will be the demand. Think of an economic business problem, right? Where you have these two technologies and the demand bid of 1,000. But suppose that <coughs> the capacity of your technology is not enough to serve the demand. So up to here you have continuous goal, so 4,000, and then it jumps to 30, and that's another 3,975, 3, so that's 9,975, but it turned out that for the high demand days, there were just a few. In fact, they were... 0.5% of the year. So the delta, the delta 3 here expresses how long this lasted. For, point, for half a percent of the year, which means one and a half day, the demand turned out to be 8,000. Well, the only way to clear this market is if you push the, LNB, the energy price to 1,000, and some of these guys are willing to back off. There's no other way you can clear this market. Uh, if you go below 1,000, all of these guys will ask for power. If you go above 1,000, none of them will ask for power. Um, so you really have to keep it at 1,000 to be able to push some of these guys um, out. And then for that price of 1,000, everyone will be able to clear this supply. OK, now. Um, that's that. A uh, couple of sanity checks here. Um, the other thing to note, which is really interesting, is the energy price doesn't, you know, for those hours where you did not curtail demand, these are, these are the times of the year where you did not curtail demand, the energy price does not have to be equal to the energy price of any of the producers. But what is one thing you can tell me for these hours, over here, for example? Who will be producing in these hours? Nevertheless, um, the price, although only coal is running, is above um, the coal fuel cost. It's helping to cover its investment cost but it's not um, setting the, the price. And, and then for this, this time of the year, both of the technologies are running. But if demand goes really high for that half percent of the year, then nobody can support that level and they have to curtail something. Okay, here are the complementary conditions. So, um, I'm calculating the scarcity rents and I'm confirming that, for example, for gas, for uh, mode two, we're earning this profit, uh, $0.95 per megawatt hour, and $4.85 per megawatt hour. Now, Rafael, you got any question I asked you earlier, I was uh, asking about risk. Here is risk, right? Um, gas is lower investment cost than coal, but you go to the analysts of the company, you ask them, okay guys, how's it looking for our gas investments? They're going to tell you, well, if you invest in gas, there will be a few hours in a year where you're going to make crazy money. You're going to be producing for an LMB of one, uh, for an energy price of 1,000. And then I ask you, okay, so how many hours in a year will that be? And you tell me, well, we think it's going to be one and a half day per year. And then it turns out to be half a day per year. 
it's a pretty good guess, right? You were only off by one thing of how long it will last, but you're, you're literally screwed because you only get a third of your investment cost back, right? Whereas the coal generator, for modes one and two, they know they will be in the money. They know they will be the lowest cost uh, bidder. So this much for them is secure. Well, this is iffy, but you can see how the peak generator is, is facing substantial risk. And that's basically the criticism that people, you know, the academic analysis is really nice, and the KKT conditions are all pretty and everything, but, you know, um, <laughs> in real life, it's, it's tricky. Um, Okay, and that's what I'm talking about in this uh, slide here. So, um, basically, because demand is so steep in real markets, uh, how many hours of peak demand will have to be predictable? If demand curves were less, uh, they were more elastic, they were more responsive to price, then the energy market would also be more. Predictable. Another thing to think about in, in this market is when you're looking at the time series of this uh, of this two technology three mode market over a whole year, what you will be seeing is kind of like three levels of price. This is the low level of price and it jumps to a higher level because we have to in the market increases. Then in the middle of the day you have this huge peak and then it goes back and goes down but, and you know this thing is going up and down throughout the whole year and enormous peaks if demand curve was more elastic then you wouldn't have prices jumping up. You know when an investor sees a market like this they basically panic. It's not very promising. You know? Whereas with more elastic demand curves this thing is much more predictable, much more stable. Okay so the last thing to talk about in the class will be uh, designing capacity markets for the real world, which is a world where demand is not very helpful. Demand is in fact very inelastic. So we will, um, you know, as far as demand is concerned, forget what we just did in the previous part. Think now of how you would design a capacity market with completely uh, inflexible demand. That means that even the centralized plan model um, wor is working with a completely inflexible demand. So we cannot separate consumers depending on how much uh, they, they want uh, power. We do not have demand functions in the, capacity, the centralized capacity expansion plan problem. We have a sim single um, we, we kind of come up with an average cost of not giving electricity to consumers, which is true for everybody. Okay, that's the, the assumption that we will work with from now on. Okay, um, so that will also feed into our centralized uh, planning problem because I'm going to, you know, make a proposal for how we should design uh, markets when demand is inflexible, but the golden standards, the best alternative compared to is a centralized expansion plan model which also does not uh, have flexible demand. Now for all of this discussion the key uh, um, notion is the value of lost load. Before I define for you the value of lost load I will define the average value of lost load. What is the average value of lost load? Let's think of the Belgian system today. It's what it is. It has a bunch of generators, a bunch of transmission lines. They are what they are. They fail at specific rates. It also has some wind. The wind goes up and down at a specific pattern. Suppose we had a simulation model that could run this for like a hundred uh, years. The average value of lost load will be the average amount of megawatt hours per year that you cannot serve in this system. 
and again, remember now this system has completely infle inflexible load coming in. And if you think about it, any reasonably designed network out there, there will be a few hours in a year where it cannot serve. No matter how well it's operated and how well it's designed, you cannot protect against everything. So, and you don't want to build a system that can protect against everything because it's too expensive to build such a such a system. Um, okay. Suppose now that I take this uh, system and I increase capacity by just a bit, one megawatt. Uh, value of loss, what, what will happen with average value of loss load? And I rerun the whole simulation. But I increase the capacity just by one megawatt. It will naturally decrease. Uh, Yes, it will decrease. In fact, what will decrease is the um, uh, yes, correct. The you're gonna lose less load, so you're gonna incur less damage, and uh, you will also have and you divide that basically per megawatt hour of the uh, load reduction. So the value, the average value of lost load will decrease, and also, and, and what value of loss load is, this number normalized by how much um, the uh, load shedding changed. And let's see a specific example. Suppose, um, okay, suppose that I live in a world where I really don't know what the demand functions look like. Uh, so in uh, Belgium, we might have the true valuation of people, if they were truly uh, active in the electricity market, might be described by a def demand function like this. Again, this is the usual demand function that we've modeled with block bits and so on, et cetera, et cetera. But I really don't know this um, because Demand is not active in the market, so we don't get to actually see this uh, demand function. What is a good way to quantify uh, value of lost load? Well, suppose I have enough capacity to um, serve uh, 0.99 of um, the total load, and I increase my capacity to such a level that I can then uh, serve exactly the full load. Um, well, let's think of it the other way around. Suppose I, I lower um, um, my capacity marginally, and the total amount of load I can serve drops overall by 1%. I can uh, serve now 1% less of the load. And then I run my simulations, and I'm computing the average value of loss load. When for those hours, God forbid, when I need to curtail uh, demand, because I'm not able, when I'm curtailing, I'm in trouble. I'm randomly picking people to cut them off the network. Basically, the distribution of curtailment will be uniform over, um, over everybody. So for consumers who had a really low valuation and who were asking for most of the power, 1% of their requests will be cut back. And the lost value in, in, is this slice over here. For consumers with super high valuation, if I knew they had super high valuation, those guys would have been the last guys I would have curtailed. But because I don't know their valuation, I'm going to cut 1% off of those guys. So the, what I'm basically doing here is scaling down this curve by 1%. And the gray area is measuring how much uh, the average uh, value of lost load decreased. Okay. And then I divide this by the total megawatt hours of load that uh, I cut off. And this is a, it's a you know, way to approximate VLL uh, that you could um, employ if you had some idea of what your demand function looks like. So suppose in Belgium, for example, that we believe 
that the true demand function of the system is described by this uh, curve here. So V here is the price uh, in dollars per megawatt hour. If price were, uh, if, if the price of electricity were zero, then we would have 30,000 uh, megawatts of demand. If price were 15,000 uh, euro per megawatt hour, we would have nobody consuming power. Suppose this were the true demand function. We not, we can't know it for real because the energy market is not very active, so we don't get to see much of the demand function. But suppose we something were told by someone that this is the true demand function. Then how would we compute VOLL? Okay, the lost value is the what I'm doing here is basically the first. The first integral here is um, this whole area, <coughs> and the second integral is scaling it up, down by uh, one percent. So the second integral is the yellow area, and this is the Again, so basically I'm computing the leftover area. Uh, and it's just a triangle, so with height times um, uh, width divided by 2, you have 1% left, so this is the calculation here. So the, um, the value you lose by this marginal change in capacity is um, estimated to be 2.5. Well, two million two hundred fifty thousand. Well, how much um, load less did you serve? You served one percent less of thirty thousand uh, megawatt hours, so that's three thousand megawatt hours. So an estimate of the VOLL is seven hundred fifty dollars per megawatt hour. So in the models that we're going to work with from now on. We assume that on average, whenever I don't get to serve a customer because my capacity is not enough, it's going to hurt uh, the so it's going to hurt uh, the welfare of the system by seven hundred and fifty dollars. It's a way to come up with an estimate of uh, VOLL, not necessarily the most accurate, but a way. Okay, so what is our golden standard? The best we could do if we were out of the market environment and there was this all. Um, most benevolent and knowing being that works for everybody's benefit. Well, that creature would try and um, minimize total costs, investment costs, fuel costs, and the damage from not serving um, uh, demand. So a couple of things have slightly changed here. There's no D variable anymore, little d, because demand is not flexible. Anymore. There is some flexibility captured in this load shedding variable. This should be little l. Um, so, this is the amount of J again is indexing high demand, medium demand, low demand, and so on. You can serve the total demand that shows up either by producing or by shedding some of the load. On average, how much it hurts you to shed load is real. Okay, and you can produce more than your capacity. So it's different to think about it uh, from before. In fact, here we're minimizing costs rather than maximizing welfare. Um, but the idea is kind of similar. So uh, this is what any mechanism will try to achieve. Now, for the Example we've been seeing throughout since the beginning of the, of the lecture. Um, I told you what the demand functions were. In fact, all of them were blocks of $1,000 per megawatt hour. So the VLL turned out to be $1,000 per megawatt hour. And if you plug in this VLL to this model that I told, uh, that I have shown you here, you will get um, the same investment that we got earlier when we also had flexible demand. Of course, with other numbers or a more complex system, we may very well have gotten 
a different, not too much different, but a different investment. So, uh, but it happens that the investment is the same. Okay, and again, the highest demand mode is not served, uh, like we saw earlier. Okay, so... Now, the not interesting stuff, the interesting questions come up that have to do with market design. And this, and this will help you, you know, appreciate why it's such a complicated question. What, what's going to happen in the real time market if you had this much capacity? Everything will be fine for most hours of the year. One and a half day per year on average. That um, you know, basically, it's not um, it's not clear how you can. Um, we we see how the economic dispatch option is run. People submit supply bids. Um, there are demand bids. In this case, only think of people giving you supply bids. Um, and no matter how many supply bids you have, you really cannot uh, cover the full demand. So it's not clear from the rules of the auction what happens with this auction. And the rules of the auction don't specify for you what should be the outcome of the real time market. In these situations, and what you you have to kind of change the rules slightly so that in this case something happens in the real time market. So you have a price and you have instructions to give. So everybody has settlements, a way to pay people back. The rules of the uh, economic dispatch auction, the way we've seen them so far, don't tell you what to do in a situation like this. Um, and one proposal which is the only actually real world market design that we will have time to see and because we're out of flashes, but there, there are other ones, is that uh, it's called VLL pricing. So in systems uh, with VLL pricing, what's going to happen for those hours of the year where there's just too much demand to clear all the supply bids, the system operator will step in and say, ah, today, uh, this hour is uh, over, um, is an undersupply hour. We announce a real-time price of VLL and we randomly curtail loads. These are brownout or blackout periods, if you think about it. There is not enough uh, supply to serve everybody. The instructions that the control center sends to everybody is run to your maximum, we will pay um, uh, VOLL, it's a very high price, but everybody go to their maximum, and even though everybody will go to their maximum, there's still not enough to give energy to everybody in the network, so you also have uh, rotating outages, so random curtailment of uh, customers. So when the system operator is forced to start rotating outages, it's a critical peak condition, and the real time price is announced as VOLL. That's the rule. That's the market design of real level pricing. It's the way to manage the real time market when, when there's undersupply. Okay, now, if you think about what the system operator just did there, it's like it basically artificially created a demand curve, a demand bid for inflexible customers. Um, again, in a, in a market without flexible demand, there are no demand bids coming in. There are no decreasing demand bids. So that means in an auction like this, the way you would clear the auction is you take in your supply bids, everyone gives you their blocks. You yeah, say again. It's okay. There's enough time. Um, um, everyone gives you their blocks. You observe power demand in the control center, you give all the power you can, you note what the quantity you gave is, and you pay people 
this amount. That's the rules of the, of the, of the economic dispatch auction in a, in a market in a collective demand. But um, if it's two moves above, then by paying people a real time price of VLL, effectively what you're doing is you're artificially creating a demand bid of VLL. So it's as if everyone in this, uh, the demand side of the market, as if everyone had bid VLL for the full quantity that was asked. And you, because you set a price, a real time price of VLL, you had the right to curtail these guys because presumably since they bid VLL, they were indifferent between consumer or not. It's not really what the demand side looks like, but you don't have any alternatives at that moment. And this is kind of your best approximation of how much it hurts your average customer to not give them power. Why? Because of the calculations we did over here. If this, were, this, this is the true demand curve, but I never get to see it because the demand is not active. So I make an approximation that's as close as possible for everybody. Okay. Um, I will try to do the equilibrium analysis of this market before the computer collapses. Um, Okay, so how will investment play out in this system? The market agent, again, uh, we think who are the market agents, what are the markets, what, is, uh, what are the cash flows. Market agents now are <coughs> system operator and uh, generators. There is no consumer, uh, there's no consumers because consumers are inelastic. They're not active in any market. We just are asking for power. And what we have in terms of what the markets are, so we can write the price adjustment process, is again, just energy markets. Um, if you think about what I just described. Um, generator quantity adjustment is profit maximization for generators. It's the same as it was before. Um, I'm being paid price rho, I incur fuel cost C for demand level J, and also I'm optimizing my investment cost. I can't produce more than my capacity. Now, this is the, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the uh, market clearing or the price adjustment condition for the energy markets. If there is an oversupply, so if there's more production plus load shedding, then um, this should be capital B. Uh, if there is more production than demand, price is zero. If price is positive, it's such that supply equals demand. Okay. And the tricky part is the mechanism I just described for you. What is this mechanism saying? This is basically exactly capturing. How, how do you interpret this complementarity? earlier for clearing the option in emergency situations is if I'm forced to do load shedding, I set energy price equal to the oil load. Um, okay, so and then you know if, um, if the price is lower than the oil level, I know I'm not doing load shedding. So basically, this complementarity condition is capturing the, this rule that I described to you earlier. What, okay, collect all these KJT conditions. Well, here I haven't written them out, but we've seen them before. Um, what do you think is going to happen when we compare them to the KJT conditions of our golden ben benchmark? It's the same KJT. So arguably, in a system where you cannot distinguish customers from each other and you just have VLL to work with, VLL pricing will give an efficient uh, outcome. The criticisms are that it's really risky. So it's basically the same that I was discussing earlier with energy markets. This is kind of a real-world version of an energy 
journey you might get to suggest with inflexible demand. The amount of hours that you will have the huge real little prices that will pay back paper units are very unpredictable. So it's a very risky investment plus for those hours where basically the system is with its pants down and you can't do much, um, you can have exercise of market power. So people can withhold some of their capacity and really benefit from it. It's very tempting to exercise market power. The other criticism is that you know how you compute VLL will have a huge influence on investment if you think about it. If I put VLL at $10,000 per megawatt hour, or a hundred thousand, it makes the world of a difference, right? You need 10 hours, uh, 10 times fewer curtailment hours if the price is take, if the VLL is 10 times higher. So think of yourself in, in the shoes of a regulator right now. You're designing a capacity market. You need to come up with a VLL. If you overdo it, you're gonna have overinvestment. Two people are gonna walk in and invest in capacity in your country. If you underdo it, you're in huge trouble because, and that's happening with Europe, because you don't get enough uh, peak air capacity. You have a lot of wind that's going up and down, so your demand is extremely, um, not your demand, your net demand is extremely unpredictable, and you have balancing problems. So this is a, just a single number that a bunch of, um, well, that, that uh, regulators come up with, but it has enormous consequences for, for the future of the system.